everybody doing this morning? Everybody good and awake? Praise God. It's so good to be here this morning. I, I love coming to church. I love worshiping with you all. I love just being with you and having that sweet fellowship. We're going to have a Christmas dinner coming up in December there, and it's going to be at our Charleston campus. We have the kitchen done. It's going to be completely finished. So we encourage you to sign up for that. It's an amazing opportunity to get to know other people. I hear all the time, our church is so big, I don't know anybody. Well, come to these fellowships, and then maybe you can learn who, what their names are and get to know somebody intimately. You know, there's something powerful about when we eat together. I don't know what it is. Jesus knew the power of having food with other people. He would eat dinner with everybody. In fact, he told Zacchaeus, get out of the tree, go home and cook me supper because we're going to eat together, right? I mean, that's my kind of guy telling you, hey, let's cook something, let's eat, let's be merry, let's fellowship. And so I encourage you guys to come out to our Christmas dinner, just make a side, a dessert, and a, a sign up back there so we know how many people are coming. But the kitchen is done, and it's an amazing thing. It uh, looks so good. The floor is redone, the ceiling's redone, everything in there is redone, and we're excited for you to see that. And we also appreciate your generosity. Everybody pitched in on that, and uh, so we encourage you to come out for that Christmas dinner. Everybody have a good Thanksgiving. Everybody eat a lot, eat too much. We uh, had Thanksgiving on Thursday, and then Friday went over to Indiana to see my grandmother and spent some time there. It's important to reconnect with family members. It's important to have that relationship with your loved ones, amen? And to build those intimate moments where you'll, you'll never forget those things. As we were going to Indiana, I told my kids, I said, you're doing what dads used to do when I was your age. And so soak up these memories because life is fast. I told myself I would give anything to be an eight-year-old or 13-year-old little Bradley going to my grandma's house in Indiana. That feeling of excitement because grandma had a big old house and she'd always give us money. And I like to go there and get that envelope of money and, and spend time with my grandma and, and just those special intimate moments. So I pray you had some of those times for Thanksgiving because family and friends, they are important. We're going to do one more session of God's best. I pray you've gotten something out of this. We're going to do one more in the next week, kick into a Christmas series. Everybody ready for Christmas? You got your tree up? Anybody been listening to Christmas music yet? You're, you're officially allowed to turn the radio on Christmas. If you do it before Thanksgiving, you're one of those crazy people. So you're allowed to turn on the Christmas music. Next week, we'll introduce a, a song or two to get you in the spirit of Christmas. So uh, this week, we're going to talk about God's best. And this whole series has been encouraging us to do better. I don't know about you, but I get in a funk in life, and I, I need to do better. I need to apply myself more. I need to get more devotion. I need to get more commitment. Like Gil said, I need to get more excited about these giving opportunities and fellowship opportunities. I, I don't know what happened in 2020, but it seems like a lot of us just retreated into a hole, and we're still in the hole and never got out of that hole. And I'm encouraging you today to get out of that place, to get out of that depression, to get out of that anxiety, to get out of that hold that the devil has on your life and live free, live abundant, live like you were dying, which means embracing every single moment, positive, faithfulness, right? God's better. If you want God's best, you've got to go from good to better. And then once you're in the better mode, he will then give you his best. It's an amazing formula and equation that God has given us. If you want a better life, it's easy. Get a better relationship with Jesus Christ. If you want a better path, follow Jesus. If you want a life of abundance and freedom, look to the cross for your hope this morning. And that's what we're encouraging you to do in this series, and we want to kind of wrap it up, and I want you to know that there's times we go through discouragement. There's times we go through disappointment. I know some of you have been hit really hard here lately, right before the holidays, and you've prayed to God, and you've said, it's not fair, God. This doesn't make any sense. Why is it happening to me, right? Anybody? Why is this going on? Why am I facing this? Why are we in this season? But let me tell you what, there's always hope if Jesus Christ is on the scene. There is always hope, there's always love, there's always faith, there's always joy. And I want to encourage you that when you go through the disappointment, 
Look to God because it's in those times you will grow the most. When you're in the valley, it's, it's the time for God to get your attention because all you can do is look to God. Have you been there? I, I have no other idea how I'm going to get out of this mess. I don't have a solution. We like formulas and solutions. As men, we like to fix things. God, I, I don't know what the next step is. If I never had a problem, church, I would never know that God could solve them. And it's in those valley moments that you need to embrace, and we've preached whole series on that, but you need to embrace those moments as a way of being closer to God than you ever have. And then you rely on God. Your faith is boosted. You grow spiritually. It's normal to get discouraged at where you're at in life. That's healthy. That's God getting your attention of, hey, are you discouraged of where you're at in life? You know, Pastor Brad in 2023, by December, I wanted to be a new man. But here I am and I'm not changed. It's okay to have that discouragement, but I want you to take that discouragement and I want you to apply Jesus to the equation and say, you know what? I'm discouraged and I'm convicted and I'm going to change and I'm going to do better so I can get God's best in my life. We use that discouragement as a way to grow closer to God. But maybe this morning you're sitting here and you thought, by this age, I thought I would be somewhere else in life. By this season of my life, I thought it would be different. And Pastor Brad, life has been hard. My children, my, my family, my job, my community, life has been hard. I've been hit with a health thing that has just knocked me to my knees, a marriage issue. Life has been hard. We all make all kinds of goals, and maybe you've accomplished your goals, but you still feel empty. Have you been there? I've done everything that I ever set out to do, Pastor. I've, I've set goals and I've met my goals, personal goals, things I haven't even told anyone. And I've accomplished them, but still I feel empty. I feel like I'm coming up short. Let me ask you this morning, have you ever stopped and asked yourself, is there something more to life? Is there something more for me? Is there a purpose that I am not fulfilling? Is there a calling that I have not answered? Have you ever stopped, paused life and said, I need to search my heart? At the end of the year, I, I pray that you can do that. It's a serious, sombering moment when you stop and say, is there something more for me? Am I really being the mom and dad that I need to be? Am I the husband or wife that I need to be? Am I the child of God that I need to be? Am I the church member that I need to be? Am I the community member that I need to be? I want to challenge you this morning to stop in the busyness of life and to say, God, is there more? And it's in that moment when you say, God, is there more, that he begins to take you from good to better to his best because you're longing for God. There's a thirst for the things of Jesus and no longer a thirst for the things of the world. So many people are so wrapped up in what YouTube says and TikTok and Instagram and Facebook. How about you get your face out of that book and get your face in God's book and say, Lord, is there more for me? Am I living my best life? Am I where I need to be? Am I measured up to God's standard? And I know you're sitting there saying, I don't like this preaching, Pastor. I don't like preaching it, but I'm going to give it this morning because I want to tell you there is more. If you will stop and say, God, is there more? I'll answer that for you. With Jesus Christ, there is more. There is an abundance. There is a freedom. There's a deliverance. There is more this morning because with Jesus, there's always something else. With Jesus, there's always a next step. With Jesus, there's always hope. Amen? If you've ever read Hebrews chapter 11, I encourage you to do that if you haven't. But if you're a seasoned believer and you've been in devotions and you've read your Bible, no doubt you have passed by Hebrews chapter 11. It is known as the faith chapter. And when you read through that, you see God's faithfulness down through the generations of the Bible, all the way back to Cain and Abel. 
And, and Paul, who they believe wrote Hebrews, goes through all of the hall of fame of faith. Did you know in the Bible there is a hall of fame of faith? Men and women that were mighty and great that stood strong for God even in adversity and overcame obstacles in their life, even though they weren't perfect, even though they didn't always get it right, they always came back to the source of their strength. And because of their faithfulness, the size of a mustard seed, Hebrews 11 just lays it all out that these are the men and women of faith that you need to look to in your life and model your life after. And as you get near the end of this chapter, they begin to list all kinds of names that I would consider honorable and worthy of being put into the faith hall of fame. If there was a faith hall of fame, they would be listed there. In fact, names like Noah, Abraham, Sarah are mentioned, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Samson, David, and Samuel. If you know your Bible, you're like, boy, those are some heavy hitters. Those are famous people, Pastor Brad. They're listed. Yeah, they're listed in Hebrews chapter 11. But what a lot of people don't realize is what the end of Hebrews chapter 11 says in verse 39. And that's where I want to take you today. After he lists all of these great men and women of faith, here's what Paul writes to you today. And I want you to hear this, and I want you to feel the weight of it, and I want you to feel the encouragement by this statement. After he lists Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Samson, all of these great men and women, here's how he wraps it up for you today in 2023. Listen, all these people earned a good reputation. We talked about that last week. They earned a good reputation because of their faith. You can earn a good reputation because of your faith that can change your past. It can erase your past. I had someone in recovery recently come up to me and say, Pastor, I've been expunged of all my charges from my past. All of my drug felonies, they wiped them clean. They wiped them clean. Let me tell you, that's what God does whenever you come to him. He will expunge you of your record. He will wipe you clean. He will give you a good reputation if you start to walk it out by faith. People will see a change in you. Something's different about Kelly. She's walking differently. She's talking differently. Her purpose is different. Her calling is different. And that's true for your life. And now you have a godly reputation. The old is gone and the new has come. Amen? Praise God for that. And that's what he said. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. But then, this caught me this week in a different way than it ever has. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. What? They are like the heroes of faith. And they still didn't accomplish everything that God had promised to them? What are you talking about? For God had something better in mind for us. Oh, that better make you excited this morning. That better encourage someone this morning that God had something better for you in 2023 than even Abraham, Noah, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Samson, David, and Samuel. God has something better for you today. What is it? Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. See, they didn't have Jesus. He didn't come until after their faith and after their walk and it didn't discount what they were and what they did and who they were and how they acted it does not discount that but friend today you need to read the word of God and know that you've been charged with something greater than even the heroes of faith in the word of God you have been entrusted with something even more powerful oh but we still are lazy and comfortable and complacent and complaining all the time and grumbling and bitter and angry and frustrated when we're sitting on a gold mine, when we're sitting on the promises of God with Jesus Christ that you can be different. Oh, we've got to get into God's better. Time is short. Your opportunity will not last forever. Your life is not even promised for tomorrow. We've had people in this room lose their loved ones prematurely. And you know 
That life can be very short and unpredictable. But yet we sit there and spin our tires because we're stuck in the past. We sit there and spin our tires because we're full of pride and we don't want to humble ourselves in the sight of God and in sight of other people. We sit there and we stay in our misery and in our sin because we never fully accept the forgiveness and the love and grace and mercy of Jesus. There's power in the blood this morning to save you and to free you from your sin. There's a holy life that God wants you to lead. Is that perfect? No. But it's trying harder today than you did yesterday. But we get in this rut where we just sit still and say, God, give me, give me, give me, give me. And we take, 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 and we're selfish. And God is saying, I want you to wake up. I want you to get up. I want you to suit up with the armor of God and go out in this world and show them that there is a better way. If you're not better, you can't show anyone else that there's a better way. They don't want what you've got because that's what they've got. They want something different. Woo, I'm fired up this morning. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's brewing, but church, you better get ready. Oh, like John the Baptist, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He's wanting to do something great, but he needs a people that are great. He needs a people that are working out their own salvation. He needs a people that are walking in sanctification. Do you even know what that big word is? It's the act of dying out to yourself every single morning. Saying, God, your mercies are renewed for me today. But I read that and I thought, my goodness, these mighty Jewish heroes did not receive all that God had for them because Jesus, the promised Messiah, had not even arrived on the scene. We take a lot for granted, church. We don't realize what we really have today. We don't realize the sacrifice of our ancestors, and maybe we realize, but we don't focus on that. Let me tell you what, there was a path paved by the great men and women of the Bible that we can build upon in today's world. We can learn from their mistakes and say, I'm going to live different, I'm going to do different because we have the promise of Jesus. And by his blood we are saved, by his blood we are healed. We are delivered. We have something better and access to something better because of Jesus. Can I hear an amen today? So today I want to focus on our decisions and our devotion. Better is good devotion to God, to our family, to our marriage. Better is good devotion. Did you know that the direction of your life is determined by the quality of your decisions? The quality of your decisions will dictate the direction and path that you take in life. What decisions are you making today? Because I can guarantee you they will impact you later in life. The word of God says you reap what you sow. Like we said last week, we make our decisions and our decisions make us. I have found that to be true. I've made bad decisions and I've reaped bad results. I have sowed good seeds, good decisions, and here comes an abundance of God's blessings, right? It's not complicated today. It's, it's easy, really. It's simple. It's just hard to do sometimes. It's hard to act out, and I get that. Most of us know this, but we still make bad decisions. We know all of what I'm preaching today, but we still make the bad decisions, and we get frustrated at God because we don't have his best. Well, if you're doing bad and you're making bad decisions, let me tell you what, you're not going to have God's best for your life. You might still have salvation because that's the goodness of God, but you might not be living your best life now. Have you heard that, live your best life? Well, if you want to live your best life, you better get in God's best to live your best life in this world. We all know it, but sometimes we still fail to make good decisions, and I get that, and that's why I'm encouraging you today to change. 
Some of y'all got some weighty decisions right now. At the end of the year, you're trying to figure out some things. Look to God. He is your source. He is your strength. He is your hope. And he can help you, guide your life. I tell you, in order to better your life, you have to be ready first. You have to be ready and willing to change your life and to better your life. Then you have to be consistent. You have to work it out. It's a daily thing. You have to be faithful. You have to be generous. You have to be devoted. And you have to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple is. That's what a Christian is. A follower of Jesus. Lord, wherever you lead me, I will follow. What you feed me, I will swallow. I'm here, God. I'm signed up. I'm ready. I don't have a clue where we're going, but as long as I'm following your coattail, I'll go. I'll walk. I'll be right there and step behind you. And when you get in that place, and when you stay in that place, and when you devote yourself to that place, you will see things happen in your life like you've never seen before. It's an amazing, amazing thing today, church. I want you to get fired up this morning. I want you to get devoted. I want you to get committed. I I want you to look at Jesus and stop looking at the things of this world that will dim and lose their value someday. Because my God is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and he's got something better for you. Matthew 6, 33. We read this all the time. I pray it's memorized and in your soul. It says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. When you seek God first, that's the beginning of God's best and better for you. When you put God first and you don't have any other idols ahead of him or before him, God will then begin to give you a better life. So what does it mean this morning to be devoted to Jesus Christ. What does that look like? What is our goal here? I want to go all the way back to the first century believers in the book of Acts. I want to go back to the very first fellowship, the very first version of church as we know it that has grown from that example into what it is today. And I feel like sometimes we need to get back to the church that was in Acts. I feel like we need to get more devoted like they were. We need more of the Holy Spirit like they had. We need a little bit more power like they had in the book of Acts. We need a little bit more generosity like they had in the book of Acts. More fellowship. That's what was important to them. But if we want to see what a follower of Jesus looks like that's devoted, let's look at the first century believers. It was after Jesus had been raised from the dead. That was all very present and real in their life. He had been raised from the dead, and we know that he ascended to the right hand of the Father is what the Word of God says. And the believers were gathered in the upper room, and God sent a wind, a mighty rushing wind, and fire settled upon each soul. Did you know that in the Word of God? There was a wind, that blew through that upper room. Oh, that gives me Jesus bumps this morning to think about that mighty rushing wind seeping through those windows and blowing across that room as the first century believers sat there scared out of their mind but knowing that God had something better for them. You see, it wasn't until they were empowered with the Holy Spirit that they were empowered to go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your heart this morning, church. You need a new filling of the Spirit of God. And I'm not talking about rolling on the ground and foaming at the mouth with your eyes rolled back in your head. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a Holy Spirit that will help you live a holy life, a Holy Spirit that will help you be devoted, a Holy Spirit that will be your comforter and your guide, a Holy Spirit that will enable you to be all that Jesus has called you to be. You need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. You look at these men and women in Acts as they sat up there in the upper room. They were already followers of Jesus, literally. These men physically walked with the Son of God. They didn't need to get saved. They didn't need salvation. They didn't need to have a new walk with Jesus. They needed a fresh anointing from the Holy Spirit. 
They needed a new renewal of the power of the Holy Ghost. Can we say Holy Ghost this morning? Say it, it feels good. One, two, three, Holy Ghost. Oh, there's power in the Holy Ghost this morning. I know that's an old-fashioned term and you all are thinking about Halloween, but let me tell you what, there is power when the Holy Ghost falls on you. Power! Oh, church, we gotta get back to like it was in Acts. We gotta get back to where we're caring what other people think and what they say and say, Lord, I don't care what others say. Let the power of God fall on me. Let it fall on me, God. Church, we've lost our way. Oh, we've lost our focus. We're so wrapped up in programs and this and that and all this is all good but we're so wrapped up in oh it's got to be an hour oh I don't even know if I can make it to church on Sunday let me tell you what if you don't make God a priority in your life you will never have power or God's best in your life you got to devote yourself you got to get committed you got to get dedicated for the kingdom of God church it's time for us to rise up I preach it all the time and then I get into a funk. But I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to try my best to keep the fire of God burning in this pastor's heart like it's never burnt through the generations of this church. And we are going to raise up a generation of believers that are filled with the Holy Spirit, free from sin, working out their salvations, devoted and committed, going out into the world and telling them about Jesus so we can experience God's best and they can too. This world is dying and going to hell every single day while the church sits on the sideline, complacent, lukewarm, not caring, lazy, comfortable, disengaged, frustrated, angry, bitter, hurt, hurt, hurt. There's so much hurt holding us back, church. Hurt from a relationship. This isn't even in my notes, but listen. Hurt from a relationship. Hurt from a church. Hurt from a friend. Hurt from a family member. And your bitterness is holding you back from all that God wants. Your unforgiveness is holding you back from God's best in your life. And for years you have sat there with purpose and potential and the power of God hovering over you. And you've never tapped into it. There's a ministry for each and every one of you, but I would say only 20 or 25% of you have actually discovered your ministry. What about the other 75% that is still spinning their tires and still living life good and okay and complacent and comfortable and lukewarm? Church, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm not trying to be mean this morning. I'm trying to fire you up. You need to look the devil in the eyes and say, Satan, you did not buy my freedom. You did not buy my salvation. You did not pay for my healing that I received back in 2018. You did not pay for it. You did not do anything for me. You didn't give it to me and you can't take it away. I've got a power. I've got an authority. I've got a blood. I've got a salvation. I've got a sanctification. I've got a devotion. I've got a commitment. I've got the Lord on my side. And if God gave it to you, he's just going to grow it and continue to grow it if you will walk it out. Oh, devotion. We haven't even gotten into the church there in Acts, but let's look in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Let's look at what they were devoted to. It says it right there, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That means every single one of them devoted themselves to the word of God, not just on Sunday morning. They got in God's word, and they didn't just read it. They applied it to their life and to fellowship. They knew what it meant to come to a Christmas dinner and eat with other believers and have fun and share life. They knew what it meant to start a small group with other people in the church and say, come on over to my house. We're going to make pretzels tonight. We're going to eat good and then we're going to eat on the word of God and we're going to check on each other and make sure that you're okay. Make sure you're okay. Make sure you don't need anything. We've got to grow smaller in order to grow bigger in our lives, in our hearts, in the church, in the kingdom. 
There's so many people that you no longer want anybody to come to your house. You see, there used to be something back in the olden days called community. You would sit on your front porch and your neighbors would come over and they would visit with you and you'd have fellowship. You actually knew your neighbors, you loved your neighbors, you helped your neighbors, you served your neighbors, you were there for your neighbors. I don't know about you, when I pull in my neighborhood, there's some neighbors that'll hit that garage door button, run in as fast as they can and hit it again to shut it so they don't have to wave at me. Church, we gotta get back to community. And it starts with you guys. Mike and Cassidy, we got some community, don't we? They were at a Black Friday sale. I just wanna give them a quick shout out for the glory of God this morning. They were at a Black Friday sale yesterday and found me a KitchenAid mixer on sale. Oh, I've been praying for a KitchenAid mixer for a long time, church. And I went to my wife and I said, you know, I can make pretzel dough a lot easier because I've got a good Amish pretzel recipe. Oh, it'll put some pounds on you, but it also encourage your heart and just bless you. And I said, I can make pretzels so much easier. My mama had a fried pizza recipe. Talk about heaven's manna. Fried pizza, it's this big old dough pocket of yeast dough stuffed with cream cheese, mozzarella, and egg, and salt and pepper all fried up and ooey gooey. Then you top it with tomato sauce. Whew. We have community. And I said, if you will get that KitchenAid mixer, Mike, I'll pay you back. You deliver it to my front door. He even went up at Target, Target, right? Target. You went up to the associate and you worked out some kind of deal and got it even cheaper, praise God. <laughs> See, that's fellowship, that's community. That's utilizing other people's gifts because Mike's a negotiator. He's a salesman. He sells bread for a living. And he just went up there and said, hey, we're gonna make the bread of life with this. You better give us a discount. Woo, glory to God. Community fellowship. And now they are saying, we got this KitchenAid mixer. You're going to have to make us pretzels. You're going to have to make us fried pizzas. <laughs> and we'll have them over and we'll do that fellowship community. It's important, all right? And to sharing in meals. There it is again. Man, I love the church in Acts. They had a lot of potlucks. That's my kind of people. Seriously, they did. They just said, we're going to pray. We're going to have fun. We're going to do life. We're going to encourage each other. Lori, you bring the potato salad. And boy, Cindy, you make a mean peanut butter pie. I haven't had that in years. Bring it on over. Bring it on over, right? Stacy, every year at the Windsor Harvest Picnic, you make some mean food. Bring it on, man. Bring it on. I'm serious, church. In 2024, we got to get out of our comfort zone and get into a community of believers that are fellowshipping with each other in order to get into God's best. It's the Bible. The early church in Acts devoted themselves to teaching about the Word of God and reading the Word of God. They devoted themselves to fellowship with each other, which if you will fellowship with each other, you will find out what the other brother or sister is carrying in their life and you can help them carry their load through prayer and through meeting their needs. They shared meals with one another and they made prayer a priority. Wow. So if you want to see what a church can do Let's read the word of God every day. Apply it to our lives. Let's fellowship more with each other. Let's eat a lot more together. Even if you're a vegetarian, you can bring your broccoli and I'll bring my ribeye and we can still have a meal together. And I won't frown on you and you better not frown on me. Some of you judgmental vegetarians, if you're gonna be that way, just let me have my Texas Roadhouse and you stay home and eat your spinach. Popeye. They heard teaching about the word of God. They fellowship with each other. They shared meals with each other and they made prayer a priority. And I tell you what, the reason I'm telling you that is because then the very next verse, here's what was birthed out of that devotion. If you want to see a recipe for a church that's different and on fire, you follow that verse right there. Check them off each week. Did I fellowship? Did I share a meal? I invite somebody out for lunch. Gil, we've went to lunch before. A special intimate time, you and I just talking about life together, mentoring each other. It's an amazing thing. Let's do more of that, church. Get to know someone across the aisle. Well, I don't know anyone. My mama said you've got to be friendly in order to make friends, Bradley. 
go be friendly. And if they're mean to you, come give me their name and we'll kick them out of the church. We don't have room for that. Well, they were nasty, mean, and discouraged, and angry, and bitter. See ya. Seriously, we got to do better to get God's best. And here was what was born out of their devotion. Boy, I'm fired up this morning. Listen, I want you to get this, church. I want us to become all that God has for us. I want you to get excited. I want you to leave here with a passion and a renewed fire for your life. Here's what was birthed out of their devotion in 43. A deep sense of awe, reverence, fear, holy righteousness came over all of them when they began to devote themselves to these things. And this next line knocked me right in the heart. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. I've heard people say so many times, the church doesn't have any miracles anymore. The church doesn't have any answered prayers. The church don't have these signs anymore. The church doesn't have the move of God like they used to in the old days. Let me tell you why. Because we're not devoted. If you're going to say this is a recipe for devotion unto God and for the church and for the people, you'll never get the end result until you follow the recipe. If I give you a Texas sheet cake recipe and you only put flour and baking powder in it and nothing else and you throw that pan in the oven, you ain't going to get Texas sheet cake. And what a lot of us are doing is saying, I want to be devoted, but I'm not going to do this, 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 or that. Well, you're not going to get the finished product. You're not going to get all that God has for you. So quit getting mad at God. Look inwardly and say, I'm not applying everything. (laughs) I'm missing something. I'm missing an ingredient ingredient in this recipe. If you want a big miraculous sign and wonder in your life and in your church and in your community and your family and your home and your marriage and your children, you get fully devoted to God and you will see things start to happen. You will see the fire of God and the power of God and the Holy Spirit like you've never seen before. Oh, church, let's get devoted. Let's seek God's best. Oh, anybody else feeling this energy today? The power of God's fallen on you right now and you need to embrace it. Some of you are sitting there struggling with this sermon saying, oh, he's crazy. Why is he yelling at me? And why why am I part of this church? Some of you just considered that. Why do we even come to this church, honey? This is weird. You better get weird. You better get crazy. You better get different than the world if you want something different, crazier, and weirder. (laughs) It's not weird whenever you get the Holy Spirit, whenever you get the power of God. It's not weird. It empowers you. And you will be able to walk worthy of your calling. You'll be able to pray for healings and they will happen. Do you believe that? You will be able to pray for your unsafe family member and the power of God will convict them like you've never seen before. Lord, don't take their life, but get their attention. God, wake them up. Bring them back like a prodigal child. Let me tell you what, if you want God's best, you better start living your best life now full of Jesus and faith and devotion and commitment, sacrifice. Christianity is not a cakewalk. Christianity is not a social club. Christianity is not this pretty painted thing that we try to make church. Christianity is messy and nasty and ministry and it's hard at times. It's sacrifice, it's committed. Every single one of these apostles that devoted themselves to Jesus Christ died a martyr's death. And they knew they would, but they still devoted themselves. There is no threat of persecution here in America yet, praise God, but still we don't devote ourselves. Oh, that better wake you up this morning. There's no one standing outside this door with a gun that's going to ask you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ when you leave. But y'all are living like it. You're spinning your tires like there's some kind of big persecution and threat. People make fun of me. Oh, who cares? 
People aren't going to like me. Who cares? I'm not going to be popular. Who cares? I'm not going to be cool. Who cares? I want to be known in God's kingdom, not in this world. I want my name written on the book of life, not a big name of fame in this world. You can write my name up in permanent markers and shine lights on it. I don't care, but I want my name in the book of life. Oh, boy, we're preaching today, y'all. Woo! Anybody getting it? Four of you. Anybody getting this today, church? We're going to move. We're going to do something. I'm not going to just keep up here preaching out of habit and giving you good sermons just to make you feel better. I want to stomp on your toes so that you will say, you know what, I better listen and change and heed the word of God. I would rather have my toes stomped on here and be told the truth than to get to the gates and be barred and sent to hell because I thought I had what I had. Many will say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done all these things in your name? And the Bible says, depart from me, I never knew you. You better know that you know that you know that you're saved and you better walk it out and you better live it because when Jesus gets in your life, the old is gone and the new has come. And I've even had to learn that as a pastor. There's been seasons in my life, I'm like, man, I'm not where God wants me. And God says, come. I'm right here, I'm ready. Oh, all you gotta do is turn and he's right there. It's not a bunch of steps. See, I think we get discouraged from change because we think, boy, there's a lot to do. You don't have to do nothing. There's one thing you gotta do. Call upon the name of Jesus and it's done. Jesus, come into my heart. Change me, devote me, commit me. And you'll be right back to where you started. At the foot of the cross with a clean slate for your new journey. Devotion, commitment, God's best. Anybody get anything out of this? Good. It's all God. I didn't have half of this in my notes. Whew. I pray Lord just use me and sometimes he does. I'm just like, whoa, slow down a little bit. You ever feel like you can't keep up? I'm like, oh. Now, breath, Lord, I'm sweating up here like I'm running a marathon. But I want you to know that word in the Greek, they devoted themselves, wasn't a one-time thing. If you study that, it's a continual devotion. See, a lot of us, I'm devoted. Well, I mean, are you continually devoted or were you devoted eight years ago? Because 20 years ago, being devoted ain't going to help you now in 2023. There is a continual devotion you've got to wake up with every single day. Lord, I'm devoted today more than I was yesterday. Mountains are higher, rivers are wider, problems are bigger. There's things I'm going to have to face. I'm going to need you more today than I did yesterday. So help me to remember, God, I need you more today, right? They were continually devoted as I read this passage about some of these first century Christians and believers, my mind went to what this verse would look like if it was written for our church. My mind went to what this verse would look like if it was written for the American church in this culture, in this generation. You see, there's a lot of people in today's culture that I call kind of Christians. Kind of Christians. And what I mean about that is you kind of believe in God, a little bit. You kind of worship, especially on Sunday for that song that Jackie does that you really like. Brad, I kind of worship during that song. I kind of tell people about Jesus whenever it's not going to look awkward or weird. I kind of live a life worthy of my calling whenever it's easy and comfortable. I kind of give my tithe. I kind, kind of give to other people. I kind of practice generosity. I, I kind of want to be devoted, Pastor. I kind of want to go to church. I kind of want to pray. A kind of Christian. Imagine if this verse would have been written about casual Christianity today in today's culture. Here's the Brad Brown version for today's world. Acts chapter 2, verse 43. And it's on the screen, so it's official. <laughs> just a side note for some of you new people. I don't have a version of the Bible, okay? Just letting you know. 
I know some of you are like, this is a weird church. He wrote his whole Bible. <laughs> they devoted themselves to themselves. Would that describe our church? Would that describe your faith? Would that describe your Christianity? Would that describe your devotion? They devoted themselves to themselves. They continually and passionately pursued a self-centered life of comfort and ease. Whew. Convicting. Where are you today, church? Is that the verse that would sum up your belief and your devotion and God's best in your life? Or could you read they were devoted to the word of God? They were devoted to the truth. They were devoted to Jesus. They were devoted to one another. They were devoted to prayer. That's where I want to be. As for me and my house, that's where I want to live. That's where I want to stay in that continual devotion. You only get 168 hours in one week. Did you know that? 168 hours in one week. And most of you devote 56 of those hours to sleep. Can I hear an amen? Praise the Lord. Everybody loves sleep, right? Am I the only one that loves sleep? I love bedtime. In fact, I used to call my bed the word so that when people would call and wake me up, they'd say, Pastor Brad, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just in the word. I'm in the word right now. I was really in bed. I didn't do that, but that would be clever. You could do that and get by with it. People think you're really spiritual. Wow, every time I call Brad, he's in the word. <laughs> But 56 hours of sleep each week, you, you, you have to have that. I think that's like eight hours. And some of y'all don't get eight hours, so you can minus that off of there. That leaves us with 112 hours. 112 hours a week. Then you take away 35 hours spent on our phones, computer, tablets, and TVs. Now we're down to 75 hours a week. Is this hitting anybody yet? Hold on. We are an equal opportunity offender, so just stay with me. You'll be offended at some point. Take away the 40-hour work week for a lot of us. That leaves 35 hours. We take at least seven hours a week to eat. Some of us more, some of us less. I mean, think about that. Seven hours a week to eat. That's 28 hours left. Then there's another seven hours a week showering, getting ready, doing your hygiene. Hopefully you do that. That's another seven hours a week getting ready. Now you got 21 hours left and we're devoted to everything but God. And here's what a lot of us do. Lord, I know there's 168 hours, but I'm gonna give you an hour, maybe an hour and a half on Sunday morning and that's it. Whew. Then you wonder why you don't have God's best. Well, you're not spending any time with God. You have 168 hours and you only give him one hour? That's a terrible ratio in percentage if you look at it mathematically. That equation doesn't even add up. That percentage doesn't even make sense. How about we slow down in life and we start scheduling God in it? We, we start saying, Lord, I got 168 hours. I'm going to try to spend as many of those hours with you as I possibly can. I'm going to pray continually like the word of God says. And I don't mean closing my eyes and going into big devotions. That just means, Lord, help me. Help them, Lord, to be with that person, right? Continual devotion. It is every waking hour if you really want to get devoted and committed. You realize in the Bible, a lot of those men and women took, what, two, three hours a day to pray? And I'm not talking about legalism and works here. But I'm going to tell you what, if you will devote some time for the word of God and prayer every single day, maybe a couple times throughout your day, your day will be better. Even if it's a bad day, you're going to read something, you're going to say, all right, I got to knock that off. Thanks, God. All right, Lord, you need to apply that to my situation, right? As we prepare to close the day, I think so many times, just like that big Thanksgiving dinner. A lot of you aren't showing up to the table to eat. You're not showing up to the table and it's time to eat. And he's got a banquet prepared for you is what the word of God says. And all you're getting is a doggy bag. All you're getting is the leftovers that you take and put in your heart and put in the fridge. I'll pull this out later. I'm going to microwave it. It's never as good leftover as it is when it's fresh and on the table. And church, 
we got to start getting to the banquet table when it's prepared and ready and get it while the, good, the going is good. We got to get to the table and say, Lord, feed me everything you want. Give me everything you need. I'm thirsty. Give me the living water that'll never run dry. I'm hungry. Feed me with the bread of life that can only satisfy. I'm in need. Give me the blood of Jesus that can purge and purify my sin and my past. Continual devotion. There's a lot more to this, but it's a simple thought this morning. Do you live intentional? Do you live fully devoted to God? I'm serious. If we would get back to the church in Acts and start applying some, not all, but applying a lot of that to our church today, you would see things begin to happen in this church like we've never seen. If you want to see revival break out, you get a group of people that's already been revived and is seeking revival daily, continual, and you'll see other lives begin to change because of your devotion and your faith to Jesus. Let's stand this morning. What really matters in your life? What would you like to do different? What do you need to work on? Where are you in life? What's next for you in life? Heavy hitting questions, but I want it to weigh heavy on you for just a moment. And I want you to respond today in your heart. You can come up to the altar. You can bow your head right where you're at. You can seek Jesus. But I tell you what, we need to get back to the basics. We need to get fully devoted. We need to start walking the walk and talking the talk that we say that we walk. We need to start saying, Jesus, I want all of you. Jesus, I want more of you. We need to start working out those things that are holding us back from God. We need to get over those addictions that are keeping us from all that God has for us. We need to get past our sin and say, Lord, you're gonna have to take that and make me a new creation in Christ Jesus. And when you're fully devoted, It'll help you make better decisions and it'll help you live in God's best. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Come down right now. Take this from me, God. Pour it into our hearts. God, my words are feeble at times. I can't get it all right, but Lord, you can get into our heart and do things that no man ever can. Convict us, God. Slow us down right now, God. We're so busy. We just want to rush through today's service because it's been a busy last couple days. But God, our soul is more important. God, there's a weight in this room that needs to be lifted. There's things in our heart that we need to quit doing. There's things in our heart we need to knock off. Things in our heart we need to devote to you. We need to stop playing games, God. We need to get back to your best. It's not about works, God, but I tell you, you did a work on the cross, and because of that, the byproduct is good works in our heart and our life. Give us that, God. Lord, slow us down. Maybe just pause for a moment and search our heart. Nobody looking around, nobody rushing. Oh, Lord, are we fully devoted? Are we committed? Are we doing what your word says? Are we worshiping you? Are we praying to you, God? Are we reading your word and applying it to our life? Are we seeking your best, God, or are we selfish and looking for our own way? I'm going to give you just a moment. Come on now, church. Get real. Come on. It's time. Let's do it. Take a moment. Search our hearts, God. Jackie sings, if you have a need, then won't you come? There's no embarrassment, there's no shame, and I feel the conviction of God in this room today. And conviction encourages us to change. It encourages us to do something different. Condemnation is from the pits of hell, and it'll push you down and give you regret and shame. That's not from Jesus. 
I want you to feel conviction where you're motivated to do something different in your life and in your heart. And if you feel that today, won't you come?